What's going on, everybody? I need to turn down some music. There it is. All right, let's see. Just need to fix one little audio thing here and then we'll get going. So let's see, sound settings. And sound settings. I'm gonna set this over to, there we go. Not on that one. That's gonna be way too loud. Let's put it over on that one. There we go. How's it going, everybody? Uh, sorry for the audio hiccup there. Um, cool, I am Ian Douglas. I am the author of the website, techinterview.guide. And uh, I stream twice a week around interview prep, job prep, career prep, all that good stuff. And tonight I've got four topics that I kind of uh, gathered from the community real quick. Uh, just like, hey, if you're going to tune into a live stream, what kinds of things do you want to talk about? Um, and some folks came back like right away. So I've got four things I want to address. Uh, and I want to call these folks out and, and thank them for their time uh, and, and sharing some topic ideas. Some of them are going to be pretty near and dear to their hearts, and uh, I'm sure they won't be alone in these. So I uh, definitely want to address a couple of uh, topics here. So uh, let me just drop that in chat. So some of the things that we want to talk about tonight is like, how do we talk about our past experiences on our, on our resume um, or during the interview? Like, how do we talk about... Um, you know, how we've learned things and how we're going to apply that to uh, a job going forward. Secondly, I want to address um, how do we quantify things on a resume? So somebody actually brought up in, in one of my Slack communities, like, hey, you know, how do we how do we bring up uh, or like, how do we write on a resume that you sped something up by 10 percent or, you know, you made something 200 percent better, you know, things like that. Um, those are, uh, really important things to put on a resume, but like, how do we even come up with that stuff? How do we track it over time and, and so on? So I want to talk about that. And then lastly, um, the more awkward side of interviewing, like, how do you talk about, you know, leaving a job after a short amount of time, whether it was a layoff or you got let go, or you just decided like, this is not the place for me. How do I get out? Um, and then how do you talk about that in the next interview? Because anyone looking at your resume is going to go, hey, you were only there a short time. What happened? Because uh, they're going to naturally be curious about that kind of thing. Um, and then also, how do you avoid talking about certain things uh, about your past, whether it's a relevant job or not? Uh, sometimes we just don't want to answer questions about something. Uh, and so uh, we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, and as always, if you've got questions, please drop them in chat. If you have a, a Twitch account, you can uh, just drop stuff in chat and I will pay attention to that and I'll interject questions kind of as we go. Um, so if you got, uh, if you got things to, that you want to talk about as well, please, please, um, you know, drop that in chat. If you don't have a free Twitch account yet, uh, you can make one. It only takes a, a few moments to make one and then, uh, you can come back and just refresh the page or something and, and it should allow you to chat right away. Um, yeah, the only ground rule is like, you know, watch the watch the cursing and we're all here to be supportive of each other. Uh, those are some, kind of some ground rules that I kind of dropped like when I started the stream. Like we're all here to be supportive. We're all here to share our knowledge. Everybody's experience is valid, uh, but let's be kind to one another. We're all here to help each other out. My stream is all about just perspectives and like helping other people understand things from my point of view. But, you know, I'm just one person on the Internet um, and you should never take anything I say as like, you know, carved in stone, like it's the only way to do it. Uh, not at all. There are lots and lots of ways of doing it. Sunday, uh, just a couple of quick announcements. So Sunday, I've got uh, somebody really exciting on the stream. Uh, she has hung out on other live streams in the past on uh, the Jonan Show. And uh, uh, her job journey uh, took a very interesting turn recently. I don't want to give too much away. Uh, but she went to uh, university, got her degree, decided that wasn't for her, went to a code school and is now in a tech career. And uh, we're gonna talk to her about how she went through the job hunt and kind of wrangled a whole bunch of interviews to happen all at the same time and got uh, not one, not two, not three, but many, many, many job offers out of it. So we're gonna talk about that on Sunday. And then next Thursday, I believe, next Thursday, um, I'm going to have someone on the stream that I haven't had on before, but you've heard me talk about him a lot. 
Uh, his name is Sean Prashad. Uh, he came up with a kind of a curated list of leak code problems. And I talk about that on a YouTube video about shortcutting the leak code process. And I, I use his site as a big example in a lot of what I do when I'm telling people how to get ready for uh, job interviews and, and tech interviews. And uh, Sean agreed to be on the stream. So I think we're going to get him on next Thursday. So I'm pretty excited about that. But yeah, if you've got questions, if you've got other topics that you want to uh, chat about and address uh, on the stream tonight, please drop those in chat. Uh, otherwise, just drop a hello in chat. Let me know you're there uh, and, uh, and we'll get started. So uh, the first one I'm going to address is um, how, do we, how do we showcase previous skills um, throughout the interview process? Um, now, I think specifically this was like, how do we get the point across that hey, I was able to learn something in the past. So if you hire me, I'm going to continue to learn. Like I'm going to be able to get up to speed on things that I don't already know. And this question was more from like an entry level developer point of view. Um, and it was from someone named Marie. So Marie, thank you for, for the topic. I appreciate it. Um, and, and the idea with this is when you go into the interview, there's already a lot of things you don't know. And one of the risks that employers take is if I hire Ian, and you know how much does ian really know how much is ian going to have to learn on the job uh, and is that a risk to to the employer and in some cases it can be um, but i think that employers that that are offering entry-level positions they want to hire somebody new in the industry and and i've been certainly been at jobs where we've explicitly wanted to bring on entry-level developers specifically to help kind of train them up and mold them into the kind of engineer that we wanted to have on the team. So, you know, what what sort of qualities do we want someone to have? What sort of habits do we want someone to have? Let's just go grab somebody fresh out of school and like, let's make them sort of what we want them to be on the team. And sometimes that works out great and sometimes not. Um, but I would say it's not something only for junior level devs we also hired intermediate and senior level devs and say hey we want you to work in this way or that way and we want you to to kind of do these things uh in a particular sort of process and, and a lot of people are really open to that i mean you're paying them for the job they should follow the direction that you give them but the more senior you are in your experience on the job um the more likely you've picked up like habits along the way I was going to call them bad habits, but they're not necessarily bad habits. They're just your habits um, and the way that you typically work or how you feel you work best. Um, and some companies want to do things a little bit differently and, and different is okay. Doing things differently is okay. Um, but from an employer's point of view, we want to know that you can get up to speed relatively quickly. Uh, but we do know that there's a lot of training and a lot of onboarding that we have to do to get you up to speed, to make you productive, to make you efficient in what we want you to do. And that's okay. That's our job as the employer. If we just hire you and kind of like throw you at the work and say, good luck, you know, check in in 30 days and see how you're doing. Um, and we don't give you a good onboarding process. That's our fault as a business. We have done you a disservice by hiring you and not getting you that support. So one thing that I commonly tell people is, you know, when you're going to an interview, one question that, that people tend to ask, uh, and, and last week we had a whole bunch of people on, on the show, and I, I deeply appreciate everybody that was able to hang out last week uh, around, like, what questions should you ask at the interview? And one question that I've had to tell people to stay away from is, like, what's mentorship like when I come to the job? And on one hand, it's it's important to know that, but on the other hand, it's like, is that really an appropriate question to ask at the interview? Because it makes it sound like you're already asking them for something. When you're there at the interview trying to win them over and trying to say, this is what I'm bringing to the company. This is what I can do at the company and so on. Um, and you know, it shouldn't be as much about what you're trying to get from them. But these kinds of things are important to know. Like, are you going to walk into a job where there is no mentorship? Like you do need to find those things out. But I think some of that can be done when you're talking to your HR recruiter. You can talk to people that you're doing network and outreach to. You can always talk to them. I don't necessarily feel it's as appropriate to ask during the interview. You can, but I don't know that it's as appropriate. Um, I would be more likely to ask that kind of question uh, before getting into like the technical interviewing side of things. But 
I think it's still important that you check in with a technical manager of some kind and just say, hey, how often can I check in with you? You know, is it like, can I check in with you every week, every other week, just to make sure that I'm kind of on track with where you want me to be? Now, Marie's question specifically was, how do you showcase those previous skills to show that you can get up to speed on something new or something that you don't know? And I would, I would kind of break this into two different parts. The first part is going to be technical skills, and the second part is going to be less technical skills. So things like communication, dealing with customers, um, even just dealing with teammates, uh, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's address that one first, then we'll get into the technical side. So how do you, um, how do you show them that you've got skills where you're like a people person? Uh, now I got Office Space, that movie Office Space, in, in my head. I'm a people person. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, it's it's funny. It's a little racial, racially stereotypical sometimes, um, but you know it's it's got some good humor in there. Um, but I think you can you can definitely show like, hey, you know what? Like going through school or just going through life, these were my experiences, and now this is how I like to work on a team. This is how I like to communicate. This is how I like to kind of follow this or that process, and those are important things to kind of convey to them. As an employer, uh, you know, the company that I work at right now, for example, at Stream. Stream, there we go. You can see it on, on, the, uh, on the screen. This is also the 3D printed logo I made over here uh, for the company. Um, at Stream, part of my role is, you know, how can we interview people and just focus on the person and less about the technical skill that they have? Because we can always, it's easier to train you on the technical skill. It's a lot harder to train you on the people skills and the collaboration and the teamwork and, and you know, how to communicate effectively. Like those things are a lot harder to train into a person. And so if we can sort of switch gears on our interview process a little bit and focus on, you know, like more of the behavioral style questions of tell us about a time that, you know, you had a disagreement with a coworker. How did you work that out? Um, you know, tell us about a time that, you know, you had to be really effective in your communication or you had to be a little bit more direct in your communication that maybe made you feel uncomfortable. Like we can focus on those kinds of questions and, and draw out of them what kind of teammate they're going to be. And then, cool, all right, well, for your first week or two weeks on the job, we want you to onboard. We want you to learn, you know, these things about the technology that you're going to use. So if you don't necessarily have the tech skill, that's not going to necessarily disqualify you from the job. So... That would be like one aspect of like, how can you showcase that uh, during, you know, your initial conversations in the interview itself? Um, how do you bring up those kinds of things? And I think just being able to talk about like, here's a group project that I worked on. Or if you go to like a code school or a code program or you're self-taught or you're going through like a remote university or something like that, where you don't really get to uh, interact too often with other people, uh, maybe see if there's like a student group that you can get together to actually just work on a project together. Just so you can say, I've had experience working in a group with other people. This is how we communicated. This is how we sort of split up the work amongst ourselves. Those are the important kinds of things to learn. And then what did you learn about that? What did you learn about what it was like to talk to other people and deal with other people and hear their points of view and their perspectives and consider all of those things? So it's not like, you know, the most forceful voice in the group is the one that drives the whole project. Like everybody should have a say, how did you sort of work that out? Um, those are all good things that you can talk about during the interview, even before you get into the interview. Um, sometimes that'll actually convince them to give you the interview. The fact that you've actually worked on a team before um, can be a big draw for employers because if I hire you, you're also gonna be working on a team. You know, you're gonna have your own responsibilities. You're gonna be responsible to other people and accountable to other people to get your part of that project done. Um, so how are you working on that? How are you communicating around those ideas? And so those would be important things to, uh, to talk about definitely during the interview. Um, now from the technical skills side of it, how do you showcase like, Hey, I had to get up to speed really quickly on this or that technology. Um, for those that have followed me on the stream for a while, or those that know my past, you know, I taught at uh, the Turing school of software and design for four years. Um, and part of teaching there is we're constantly teaching like new technologies and new concepts and, and now go build a project. You got two weeks to go build a project around that topic. And so it really forces you to go learn that thing well enough to become proficient enough to go build a project in that technology. And so being able to speak to that in the interview is also really important 
because when you go get that job, you're going to be dealing with technology you've never seen, maybe a programming language you've never seen, or you're not as comfortable with or not as familiar with, um, or you know, a database that you've never used before, or some kind of framework you've never seen before, or some library that you've never used before. These are all important things that you need to be able to discuss during the interview to say, hey, I was able to go build a project on this with like very minimal introduction. I had to go out and self-learn and look, I was able to make this whole project in like a two week time span. Now, generally on the resume, I tell people like, you know, if, if you've got like a two week project, you don't have to put dates on the project on the resume. Just tell me that you did the project. I can always go look at your GitHub history. If, if, I, if I'm the kind of employer where I care how long it took you to build, I'm gonna go look at your GitHub history anyway and go, okay, well, you know, based on their commit history and the dates on there, it took them about two weeks to build this. Um, but most employers aren't gonna care how long it took. They mostly care, like, could you do it together? Like, could you build that group project or a solo project? And what did you learn from that? What are your takeaways? To see how effectively you were able to learn a concept. Now, there's also, you know, did you, did you learn just enough to implement that? Or did you go super deep on a particular aspect of it? Um, you know, did you get into, uh, like, just as an example at Turing, uh, the backend program, we taught Ruby on Rails. Um, and in the final module at Turing, a lot of students would pick up Python. Python and Ruby are similar enough that switching over to Python wasn't a big deal. And so students would go build a Python project, uh, you know, as kind of like their capstone. And at the, at the time, they only had two weeks to do it. They've since expanded it to uh, like a five-week project. But at the time, they're like, hey, we learned this whole programming language in two weeks. It's like, did you really? Like how much of that language did you really learn in only two weeks? And so being able to uh, sit down and say, well, these are the things that I learned about Python in two weeks. That's a much better story to tell than I learned Python in two weeks because there's a lot to learn about any programming language. Like generally speaking, a lot of programming principles are going to carry over from one technology to the other. And you know, when, when the programming languages are similar enough like Python and Ruby, or even Ruby and JavaScript and, and these other high level programming languages like C Sharp, they're, they're gonna be close enough that, you know, it's almost a one-to-one, -one, you know, line of code kind of matching. But every language also has its own sort of idiosyncrasies and its own like terminology. Like in Ruby, we call it a hash and in Python, we call it a dictionary. Um, in other languages, they call it like a hash map or a hash table. And so, you know, how much did you learn about how dictionaries actually work in Python 3? If you just say, well, it's a hash, it's like, okay, that's like that much of how a hash actually works in Python. But like, do you know that in Python 3, for example, the dictionaries are what we call an ordered dict or an ordered dictionary, which means the order that you put the keys in there, when you iterate back over that, that's the order the keys are going to come back out. In previous versions of Python, you put things into a hash and then you iterate over that hash. They kind of came back in like a pseudo random ish order. Um, it wasn't actually random, but it felt random because it wasn't coming back in the order that you put them in. But now in Python three, they'll come back out in the order that you put the keys in there, which can be really helpful uh, for some things. But being able to talk about like, these are the things that I learned in that short amount of time and, and uh, this is gonna kind of uh, segue into the, the next sort of topic of like, how do we quantify this kind of stuff on our resume? Um, that's the kind of important stuff that you wanna be able to talk to in an interview. So if you don't specify on the resume, this project took me two weeks, then in the interview you can say, yeah, I see that thing I built, it took me two weeks to build it. I learned enough about this technology that I was able to pick this, you know, pick up these concepts in only two weeks. And so if you hire me for this job, it might take me more than two weeks to get to a proficiency level, you know, that makes everybody happy, but I'm able to like pick things up, learn things, apply all of these other, uh, you know, bits and pieces about what I've learned about programming, about object oriented programming, or just the fundamentals of, of programming. And I'm gonna be able to apply that to this other technology and I'm gonna get up to speed like really quick. And it's about conveying that confidence that they can trust that you're going to get up to speed quickly in that technology. And so, um, you know, you have to be able to practice how you speak to that kind of stuff. Um, but it's important that you talk about what specifically you learned about that technology. 
uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna go down that path you want to be able to speak to I learned about this and this and this because then in their mind they're like okay well you know did they learn about you know these other three things now they can ask more specific questions and go you know did you get into like sets in Python uh, like what's a set um, or did you get into you know JSON web tokens you know did you get into this or that did you use this library and now they can ask more specific questions to try to hone in a little bit more on what exactly you know. Because that's my job as the interviewer, is to figure out what you know and what you don't know. That's it. That's the interview. Uh, it's like, what do you know? What don't you know? And then I need to go look at the gap on my team and go, do you fill that gap? Fully aware that, you know, there are going to be things that you don't know. Heck, even hiring intermediate and senior level devs. We're still going to worry that when we bring people on at those experience levels, that there are going to be gaps in their knowledge. And that's okay. You don't have to know all the things to go get that job. You just have to be confident in what you do know. Not overconfident, but you need to be confident in what you do know so that you can sort of pitch that and sell that during the interview and say, these are the things that I know. I was able to learn it in this amount of time. And so anything new you throw at me, I'm also going to get up to speed in relatively short order. That's how you want to present that in the interview. Cool. So that was topic number one. How do you showcase those previous skills and how do you how do you talk about them to show that you can go learn all the other things? There's so much out there to learn. You're not going to learn all the things really quick. I've been in the industry 25 years and I'm still learning stuff. Part of that is because the technologies changed so much that the way we did things 25 years ago, heck, the way we did things 10 years ago, we don't do it that way anymore. So, uh, you know, I've, I've got to constantly learn things too. I'm constantly learning new programming languages or new design patterns and new algorithmic ways of accomplishing things in code to keep my own skills sharp. Because if I don't keep my skills sharp, I'm going to get stale and it's going to be harder to, for me to go find that next great job where they're using more of the newer types of skills. If I'm gonna go find a job, you know, uh, in some technology that some company is still clinging on to, you know, 25, 30 years later, um, you know, there might be market for that. A good example of that would be um, like in the banking industry, they still use COBOL and Fortran, which are really, really old programming languages. I think Fortran was invented like before I was born. It was like 1970 or something like that, or 1972, I think when Fortran came around. Um, that that programming language has been around forever well guess what it's still in use so if you want to make bucks go learn those really old programming languages and go replace all the you know all the retiring programmers who are now in their 60s and 70s and they want to they want to go relax on a beach somewhere uh, they need to hire other people that understand that technology um, and one thing that companies do is they'll hire people that understand old technology and new technology so that they can figure out, okay, well, if you understand how to read Fortran and how to use Fortran, but you also know like C sharp, then can you sort of migrate that code, uh, over to something that's a, a newer technology. Uh, and so some companies will actually do that. So it's, it's something to, to pay attention to for sure. All right, well, the next topic that we had, uh, actually, I'm gonna go to chat for a sec. So, um, not sure how to pronounce your username, but uh, I'm not even gonna try to guess. Um, but they say in chat, I'm interested in hearing if there are alternative approaches to doing the tech portion of the interview process. Oh, Taya, hey, how's it going? Um, is it absolutely necessary to talk through your process? Are there other options? It seems like constantly talking while coding is unlikely to happen consistently on the job. That's true. Um, and there are a couple of different approaches that you can take here. The first thing is understanding the interviewer's expectation of what they hope you're going to do. But in an interview, because it's meant to be collaborative, like you're there to kind of evaluate them as much as they're evaluating you, you want to find out whether you even want to work there. Um, you can also set some expectation yourself. There was a blog post I wrote uh, last October for interviewing.io where I talk about this exact topic uh, in, as one of the points in, in this blog post uh, where you can kind of set some expectations to the interviewer as well. And you can say, this is how I typically work. Is that okay with you? Like you can say, hey, 
when you present me with that tech challenge, I want to take a like, this is how I'm typically going to work. I'm going to spend the first 60 seconds or, or so just rereading it, making sure I think it's clear in my mind. And then I'm going to ask you some clarifying questions. And then I might take a minute or two to think about it. I'm going to try to talk through that as I can. And then I'm going to try to like write out some pseudocode or I'm going to write out some notes and I'm going to talk about what I'm doing, what my decision making process is while I'm doing that. And if it's okay after that, I'm just going to go heads down and I'm going to be quiet while I write the code. Is that okay with you? Is that an okay process to follow? Interviewers will tell you yes or no, or they might say like, yeah, that'll probably be okay. You know, if I have some questions though, like, you know, be sure to bring me up to speed on things. If something changes your mind, you know, but that way you're kind of setting the stage for them on what they should expect from you. Um, because as an, as an interview candidate ourselves, one of the things that kind of heightens our anxiety besides just not knowing what's what's going to happen in the interview. And I, I just had a, a big uh, sort of blast about that on, on LinkedIn or, or, you know, or I vented a little bit. Somebody that I was coaching was told to study one thing and they would get to the interview and they were given something completely different. And and that person made the call to not progress them through the interview process. Uh, and the feedback they got later was like, yeah, they shouldn't have asked you that tech challenge question. But they also didn't say, you know what, come back in for another try. They're just like, sorry, they made the call and they said no, uh, which is super disappointing and ridiculous. And so I kind of like hopped up on my soapbox and vented about it on LinkedIn. Um, but as a candidate, then you can say like, this is what I'm going to do. This is the process I'm going to follow. Now, you don't have to lay it out in that in that fashion. You're like, you don't have to say, OK, hey, before you give me that tech challenge, let me just show you or let me talk to you about like what what i'm about to go do you can do it like as they present the challenge you're like all right here's the tech challenge go like merge these you know two sorted linked lists together into a single linked list you say cool i just want to take a moment just to read through make sure i understand it and i'll ask some clarifying questions when i'm done and then you just kind of quietly read through write out some notes and so on and then say cool well i've got a couple of questions you know, is there a length to these linked lists? Is it, you know, um, are the linked lists always sorted? Things like that. Ask, always, always ask clarifying questions on those things. And once they kind of respond back and say, you know, and they answer the questions then you say, cool, I want to take just a minute. I want to think through some design. I've got some ideas in mind. I just want to like sketch out some notes, maybe write out a little bit of pseudocode. And I'll try to talk through that process. But if I get a little quiet, I'll make sure to kind of walk you through once I'm done and then go do that. And then once that's done, uh, what you want to do then is ask them if you can go ahead and get started. Um, and one thing that I, I coach people on is don't don't write out the pseudocode. Don't don't write out the approach you're going to take and then follow that with a question of does that look OK to you or am I on the right track? because that's highlighting your weakness and it's showing a lack of confidence on your side. What you want to do instead is just say, what do you think about this approach? And just leave it at that. You don't have to say like, am I on the right track with this? Am I thinking through this the right way? You know, does this look all right to you? Because now it's sounding like I'm not even confident in what I'm doing. Like, I don't even know if this is going to work. Like, what do you think? Can you, can you make sure that I'm on the right track? You don't want to highlight your weakness. You don't want to highlight your your confidence uh, or lack thereof. So simply by rephrasing it and say, does this look OK to you or what? Or sorry, you don't phrase it like that. You just want to phrase it. What do you think about this approach? Because now you're just asking them for their opinion. Uh, remember, too, that the interview is also like this is what I'm going to be like as an employee. If you ask me to do something, I'm going to think through the design or whatever, and then I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to ask your opinion. And if you tell me that that opinion is OK, then I'm going to ask you, do you want me to go ahead and get started? Interviewers will always tell you the truth. If you write out something, write out some pseudocode and then you ask them, what do you think about this approach? They're always going to tell you the truth. I've said this on streams before. When you get to that point of the interview, they want to say yes. They want to look for a reason to just say, we found the person that we want to hire. Yes. Like, just go ahead, get started. We want to get this over with. We found, we found our person, you know, to, to fill that hole on our team. They want to say yes. They want to say yes and be done. So they don't want to, like, mislead you and go, yeah, you know, yeah, you could totally, like, 
build that thing that way and like snicker snicker uh watch watch what happens here they're gonna totally flood this up they don't want to do that you're wasting their time if they do that um and so a good interviewer will not do that doesn't mean everybody's a good interviewer but um uh, good interviewers will not lie to you when you ask them what is your opinion of this so you want to be careful how you phrase that so you want to say how uh like what what are your thoughts on this approach something something along that line and then actually get started on the code well at that point you can say hey because that design looked okay to you i'm not very good at talking while i code so if it's all right i'm probably going to be a little bit quiet i'll try to pause every now and then and bring you up to speed on what i'm thinking if if i'm going to kind of change something about my design but otherwise i'm going to go implement that thing that we just talked about um but i might do it kind of quietly so just FYI, if you want to pause me and, and ask, you know, why I did something a particular way, by all means, interrupt me. Otherwise, I'm going to go kind of quiet and I'm just going to go ahead and write this code. And then just go do the thing. If they've got a question, they'll pause you and say, hey, tell me a little bit about how you did that or why you chose to do it that way. Um, and I talk a little bit in, in some other videos about, um, you know, how to write out pseudocode. You want it to be really high level where you're not locking yourself into a particular implementation you need to give yourself some flexibility in case you change your mind. But once you get to the implementation part, the interviewer might say like, oh, why did you build it that way? Like, why did you choose to return a Boolean instead of like a list, uh, you know, or, or, or an empty list, you know? Um, so they might have some questions once you get to the implementation. But at that point, you've set the expectation for them. This is how I'm going to work. I'm going to maybe work quietly. I'm going to try to talk while I do it. The only people that are really good at talking while they code are people that have been doing it for a long time. And it comes with practice. Being able to talk while you code or talk while you're like typing other things, um, you kind of gain that skill over time. It's not something that a lot of people uh, sort of naturally do well, in my experience. And so most interviewers, again, they're going to be accommodating. They'd be like, okay, that's your process. Cool. All right. Just go ahead, get to it. And they're making notes on their side of like, this was their process and this is this is how they're working and this is what I think about that process so far. And then they're just gonna go back to the team and give them that feedback. So it's okay to have a process to follow and to communicate that process. So Taya, hopefully that answered your question. Okay, if you got other questions, please uh, drop them in, in chat as well. All right, well, let's get to the next topic. The next one came from someone named Travis and they were asking, how do I quantify things on the resume? Um, these are important things to put on a resume. As much as possible, you want to put quantifiable information on there about projects that you worked on, uh, things that you improved on the job. But not everybody has that kind of experience either. You might not have ever worked on a system where you improved efficiency by 15% or you quadrupled the processing you know, of something by you know, optimizing blah, blah, blah. Some people just don't have those experiences. But if you do, generally what I would advise is that bullet point has to start with like a really strong verb. Um, some people call them power verbs. Um, I was actually watching a YouTube video uh, recently. There's someone that I follow on YouTube. Uh, I think her name is Mayuko. Um, and she was interviewing someone else who was just talking about resume tips. And this is one of the things that they also talked about too, is you want to start with like a really strong verb, like implemented optimized like something past tense but it's like a verb of something that you did and then an immediate quantity like optimized 100 percent or you know um, upgraded process to 400 percent or you know improved something by 15 percent remember too that when when people are, are sort of speed reading these resumes because it is typical that they're only spending six to ten seconds like sort of visually looking through the resume when they go over those bullet points, they're only picking up the first five or six words of the bullet point. And so you don't want to start the bullet point with like, you know, spent time optimizing this whole project in order to achieve 20% increase in performance. Like you don't want that 20% to be way at the end of that line. You need to get it at, at the beginning of the line where the bullet point is. Otherwise, they're not even going to see it. And so that's also why I tend to advocate a lot that when you're making bullet points on a resume, they need to be short. They shouldn't be like edge to edge text and they should never wrap around multiple lines because people are not going to read them and so they don't also have to be grammatically correct you can just say optimize performance by 200 percent or optimize network throughput by 3x 
you know, uh, you know, whatever that thing is going to be as you're talking about those projects or you're talking about that role. You want to be able to quantify as much as possible, but that the the quantified information, like the actual numeric representation of what you're doing, needs to be as close to the start of that as possible. And so you want to start with a really good verb, only have like maybe a couple of words in between, and then get that number in there. Visually, we're going to pick up that number as we're kind of scanning down. It's going to draw our eye out to that number and then back to the bullet point because our, our eyes are kind of taking the path of least resistance as we're reading through that page. And so if you can throw a number in there, it's gonna draw our eye to that number because it's different than seeing text. As we see text, like our brain is picking up the words, but when we see a number, it kind of draws our line like squirrel. It's like, what was that 90% thing? It's like, blah, 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 90%? What, what did they do 90%? Wow, that's cool. You're more likely to get that noticed. Um, but it's got to be right near that bullet point. If it's like way out at the end of the yeah, end of the line or way out at the, you know, that right margin, they're probably going to miss it. Um, and so again, keep the bullet point short. Um, and when you're quantifying things, start with a verb and get that number as close to that bullet point as you can. Nine Sky Zero Zero, good to see you in chat. Uh, they ask, I had an interview where I was asked to write a method to compute mathematical operations stored in Polish notation, like one, two, three, and then plus and multiply. My first thought was, why would anyone store anything that way? My question is, could I and should I have asked that? Um, you could, but at the same time, like this is the challenge to follow. Um, Polish notation, they're like way back in the day, back in my day, um, actually even before my day, they actually had calculators that they had to be programmed in this way. And I think some early computers had to be sort of programmed this way where um, the way that the actual CPUs worked back in the day is they have something called registers and you had to put values into the register. So you'd say, um, you know, move the value of three into register AX and move the value of four into BX and then go do the addition operation. And the addition operation, uh, all you had to know is the addition operation always added AX plus BX. And so uh, when you had to write these things down in assembly code, it was like move this value into AX, move this value into BX, and now go add, do the add command. And then it would just go add AX and BX together. And so that might have been part of where Polish notation kind of like carried over, uh, where you had to do the two numbers and then the operator. Um, now, if you've got an array, and then the operators at the end, then you kind of need to like walk through the array and split the numbers from the operations. And then as you're traversing back over the array, you want to look at the at the next operation and then perform that, move on to the next number, grab the next operation, perform that. Um, that would be the, the best way to do it. But can you ask like who on earth would ever do this? You can, but um, you don't really want to question that kind of stuff in an interview either. It, it's not that it looks unprofessional, but, you know, being given a tech challenge and, and be like, why are you asking me to do this? Um, it, it doesn't really sit well. So it's a challenge. They want to see how you think through this kind of thing on the fly, how you do some problem solving, how you think about a problem and break it down into steps to, to actually go execute. Um, so I don't know that it's really appropriate to ask why. Um, you can certainly ask clarifying questions like, um, okay, Polish notation, where did that come from? Like, that's actually something I hadn't heard of before. Um, can you explain that a little bit more? Like, do I do the one plus the two and then I do the multiply by three? Um, like, does it have to be in that order or does it have to be like the typical uh, order of operations where I multiply the two and the three and then I add the one? Like, do I have to keep track of the order of like the proper order of operations? Uh, you can ask clarifying questions like that, but generally you wouldn't ask a question of like, you know, is this really something I'm going to do on the job? Um, because that starts to kind of give them the impression of like, you're going to question everything they ask you to do. Um, so generally you wouldn't ask that kind of question, but thanks for asking on chat. I appreciate that, uh, that you had that as a question. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, so I think I got Travis's thing, like how to quantify those things. Um, so Travis was also asking on that one, like, how do we, how do we get those statistics? Like, how do we know that I optimize something by 200%? Um, and, you know, how do we track those things over time? Because if I just write on one copy of my resume that I did this thing by 200%, that over time, if I forget to put that on another resume and later on, I'm like, oh yeah, I optimized that thing. Was it 200% or 300%? I'll put 300%. That sounds more, more uh, impressive. 
and and sometimes those numbers can like drift into uh, exaggeration mode um, and so it is important that you actually quantify those things and and make notes for yourself on what that optimization was because they may come back and say hey tell me a little bit more about that thing on your resume where you optimized that thing to increase by 90 percent like tell me more about how that happened um like one one uh thing that i typically put on my own resume i worked at an e-commerce company called price grabber and they were processing log data um every day to kind of go see like when i type in i want to buy a 40 inch you know flat screen tv it would kind of go back through uh, you know, these process like logs that had been processed and put back into the database to say, you know, other people that looked for that 40 or the phrase 40 inch TV, when we showed them these results, they were more likely to click through and actually buy that item. Well, by the end of the day, they would start processing those logs. And it took so long to do that 24 hours worth of logs took 22 hours to process after the fact. And so this stuff was always coming in super late. And they were getting to a point quickly where the site was getting popular and they had a lot of stuff going on that they're like, Ian, we're going to hire you to fix that because we're approaching the point where, you know, 24 hours of logs is going to take more than 24 hours to process. So what do we do? And so I sat down and I kind of examined what they did. And I was able to get it down to like two or three hours of processing time just by making another system change elsewhere in the system that when somebody actually clicked on something, we wrote a different uh, sort of log entry into the database um, so that we didn't have to try to process all of that stuff out of the logs. And so I was able to cut, the, I was able to reduce the time on this by, well, from 22 hours to three hours. So about by seven X. And so on my resume, reduced by seven X log processing time. And they're like, tell us more about that. And so then I can say, well, this thing used to take 22 hours. I got it down to like two or three hours these are the kinds of steps that I needed to do. And then the resulting logs ended up being much smaller and we were able to kind of multi-process, uh, split the logs and process those, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so then you can talk about that a little bit more, but it's important that you make notes for yourself on what you did and why, because that job was like, you gotta work there, 2006, 2007? Like that was 15 years ago. That was, that was like, you know, dinosaur, era back then uh, like who even remembers anything from 15 years ago anymore um, you know my own memory is going to get fuzzy that stuff over time unless I actually sit down and I write that stuff down and I write notes for myself on how I actually accomplished that um, and so one of the things that I recommend if you go to tech interview guide and you go into the chapter about resumes I talk about building this really long form resume um, and I kind of start it with a riddle of like how do you make a sculpture of an elephant. You start with a big block of concrete and you chip away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. And it's the same thing with resumes. If you make a really long resume where you list absolutely every detail, you can list that kind of stuff. And so one bullet point is like optimized by 7x, blah, blah, blah. And then you can make a sub bullet point and like indent it later as something that you're gonna remove of, you did this by, you know, adding this other part to the front end system and then, you know, having the back end system you know, process the logs in a multi-process fashion. And so as you're building up that new resume and you're like, yeah, I want to put that job on there because that's going to be highly relevant to this job that I'm applying to. You've got that sub bullet point where you're going to recall like, oh, okay, yeah, that's how that happened. And so I would typically keep track of all that stuff on that really long resume. Um, the other thing that I would do typically is I would put all of that detail on LinkedIn. For me, um, because I've been doing this for such a long time, my whole resume would be like in chapters if I were to like actually publish all the stuff on a resume. Um, and so I tend to keep track of all the stuff on LinkedIn to some degree. And on my own resume, when I apply for a new job, I put relevant work experience and I put down just the jobs that I think are important to them. And at the bottom of that, I'm like, for my entire work history, go look at LinkedIn. It's all over there. I'm not gonna put it on this page, but if you wanna go see everything I've ever done, go look at LinkedIn. And there are other tools out there like read.cv and like other things like that, where you can start building up in like poly work and, and stuff like that, where you can actually build out a history of these are the things that I actually did at these various jobs. And so you can put that kind of stuff on the resume too. And you can say, you know, for, for full history of all the projects I did at this job, go look at this site or that site. 
um, you can certainly put that kind of stuff on the resume. Um, and if they're interested in that, they'll go look at it. They'll follow up and, and see what's going on there. Um, so that would be like how to track that stuff over time. Now, some sometimes you're not necessarily going to know how to find those statistics. Like I improved this thing by 200%. Like how would you even know that? Um, some companies, they'll actually do logging where you can do like timing on, you know, I started the process and I finished the process and then you can like subtract those times and, and see how long it took. And then later on when you make a change, it still does that logging and you go, hey, it reduced by 30%. Now you've got a bullet point for your resume, reduced by 30%, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you can you can speak to that in the interview. And, and if they say, well, how did you track that? You'd say, oh, we used some timing logging. A lot of companies will use some sort of timer uh, in their logging. Um, and there are other systems that you can use called profilers that will do that as well. Um, so you can look into profiling tools and a profiler does exactly that. They set, uh, like as it's going through and it's calling all your code, it keeps track of like what time down to the millisecond at, at, at least and sometimes as much as like nanoseconds uh, of when it called that function and when it returned from that function. And so it'll build up this, this big graph over time of this is how long it took to actually go execute your code. If you're into JavaScript programming and you do front-end development, you can get that kind of stuff right in Chrome. You can see exactly how long it took to run certain functions and so on. There's a whole panel in Chrome on how to do that. So that's where to go get those stats. Um, and if your company doesn't currently track that kind of stuff, you can talk to them and say, hey, you know, I want to be able to track this stuff over time. And, and you can even use that as a, as a, uh, like a review tool for yourself. When it's time for that six month review or that one year review, you can go in and be like, here's my list of accomplishments. Not just, I worked on this project and I worked on this project. You can say, when I worked on that project, I reduced this thing by 30%. So now it shows like, I actually pay attention. I actually care about my input here and my contribution here at this job. And that's why you need to give me a raise. Um, most companies won't give you a raise or as much of a raise unless you walk in with hard data and say, these are the things I did like check this out you can actually go back and look at the log data and actually see this is true like i'm not just making this stuff up um, and so if your company doesn't currently track that kind of stuff just ask if you can start running a profiler from time to time maybe not in a production system maybe on a staging system um, because you want to be able to track that stuff you say i want to be in charge of like my career and i want to be able to track these kinds of statistics like did i actually improve that did i make it worse because if i made it worse how do we know it, it was worse other than just like, gee, the system is slow now. I wonder what happened. Maybe it was that pull request that Ian made. Well, maybe it wasn't the pull request I made. Maybe it was the pull request that the other Ian made. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, that pull request, you know, slowed everything down. So being able to sort of find out and prove uh, sort of the quality and efficiency of your code is an important thing to do in the industry. So if the company doesn't already do it, ask them to do it. Ask them to, to get on that for sure. All right, the next two topics that I want to get into are a little more sensitive um, and they can be a little tougher to talk about sometimes, uh, but they're a little bit related. So the first one came from Alex um, and said, how do you bounce back from like leaving a job early or getting laid off or getting let go from a job? Um, you know, it's like if you've only been at that job for three months or six months, how do you talk about that at the next job? As a hiring manager, Sometimes uh, like HR people, they'll just immediately screen out a resume if you've only been at a job for a short amount of time. But if your resume still says that you're there presently, they'll probably like just pass on that resume and go, well, you know, you're already trying to hop to a new job like three months in or six months in. They like most companies want some amount of loyalty. They want to know that you're going to stick around for a while. And if you have a history of like changing that job every six months, eight months, 10 months, um, or even like every year, um, it can start to look bad for your career. Not necessarily, but some companies will actually kind of frown on that and go, well, if we're only going to get you for a year, like what are you really going to bring and contribute? Because there's sort of ramp up time to get up to speed on what it is we do. So let's say the first 30 to 60 days, you know, you're kind of ramping up to get to that level of proficiency. And then we're only going to get like six months out of you before you start looking for that other job. Because once you start job searching, your productivity tends to drop anyway because you're thinking about leaving. So who cares about this job anymore? So 
you know, if they if they see your job history that you change those jobs pretty frequently, they know that that ramp up time and sort of the wind down period, they can kind of imagine that's gonna be about 60 days on either side of that. And so the time in the middle is really your product uh, productive time at that job. They're gonna to wanna to know that that's lasted a little while. Uh, doesn't mean you have to stay at every job for five years or anything by, by all means, but uh, you do need to show that you're willing to stick it out in a company. But this specific question from Alex is like, what happens if it's like a really bad job? Like it's just super toxic and you can't stand it there or it wasn't what you promised. What do you do? Um, this actually happened to me at a job in Los Angeles. I took a job and through the interview process, they're like, okay, well, you know, Pearl, that's great. Our whole system is in Pearl. Um, and they were using um, like a, a framework, started with an M, might've been Mason. Um, and they're like, we got this framework, we got this whole app and we want to port the whole thing over to Ruby on Rails. And at the time I didn't know Ruby on Rails. And I'm like, well, what's like, what's that process going to be to like migrate all this stuff over to Rails? And they're like, oh, we're going to like completely like we're all going to take like a month off or something or they, they quantified it at the time. I'm, I'm just pulling numbers uh, for the sake of the story. But it was like we're, we're just not going to do anything for like that amount of time. And we're just going to do like we're going to train everybody in the company on Ruby on Rails. And I'm like, you're going to pay everybody like their full time salary to go learn Rails. And then we're going to sit down as a team and we're going to port this whole thing over to Rails. They're like, yep. I'm like, sweet, sign me up. Like, that sounds amazing. Um, and I got into that job and the first day they're like, hey, we need you to change a phone number on the website. And I'm like, okay. Um, and I went in and I got looking at it and the phone number was actually a graphic image. It wasn't even text. So I'm like, hey, what tool do you folks use to, uh, to change like that text or the, the phone number because it's an image? And they're like, oh, well, you can't do that. We got to send that over to the graphics department, get them to build it, and then you'll just implement that new graphic. I'm like, all right, so what do I do for the next seven and a half hours of my day? <laughs> um, and it ended up just being a really menial kind of job. And after about a week, I'm like, what about this Rails training that you said that we were going to do? And they're like, oh, yeah, but that's like a year away. And I'm like, what like you sold me on this job because you were talking about this imminent change and it was going to happen right away and we were all going to learn rails and like no 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 that's like way way off in the future and i'm like all right i'm out see ya uh, and i literally walked away from that job like after a month i actually kind of mentally walked away from that job uh in week two um but in california if you quit a job you lose your or your benefits will last until the end of that calendar month. And so uh, it was December at the time. And I'm like, oh, I'll just stick it out for the holidays. I'll get like that week of holiday pay. And then when I go back that first day in January, I'll resign and I'll get benefits all through the month of January. And that way I can do my job hunt and I still have benefits that for that month. It was the only time I like literally walked out of the door. I walked in on that Monday. I wiped my computer and I walked away. And, uh, and they called me later that morning. They're like, did you quit? I'm like, yep, I'm done. And they're like, uh, okay, bye. <laughs> um, and so sometimes, uh, you know, it's just, it's a bad situation. You just have to figure out what to do. And sometimes you have to walk away from it. If it's toxic, if it, you know, you get mistreated, um, you know, it's important to, to spot that. You can't always spot it as you're doing networking. You can't always spot it during the interview. If you can spot it before you sign that job offer and like show up for day one, that's the best time to find out uh, so that you don't end up in a job that you're going to hate. That's one scenario. The second scenario is like, what happens if you get laid off? Like what happens if, you know, something drastic happens in the company, they don't get that round of funding that they were expecting and now they have to let you go. Oh, Riker wants to say hello to everybody. Hello. Hi. Um, what happens if you get laid off? Um, same thing if you get terminated, like just something doesn't work out and they're like, hey, this isn't working out. We're going to let you go. What do you do about that? Like, how do you talk about that? I actually listened to a really interesting podcast this week. Um, I'll try to find it. Um, actually, let me see if I can find it on Spotify without interrupting the music. Um, go over here. Yeah, there we go. Um, Let me see if I can get a link to this share episode link. Cool. I'm going to drop it in the Twitch chat. Um, 
So this podcast uh, is a podcast from a, a guy who started a company called the Candidate Club. Uh, they're not sponsoring my stream by any means, but I do listen to his podcast. Um, and he had a really interesting one uh, a couple of days ago where he's talking about relating the interview to like a first date. Like when you want to start dating somebody and you go on that first date, how do you talk about your ex? Um, and, and he was drawing some parallels and, and it was kind of interesting because he's like, you'll never hear anybody use this analogy ever. And I'm like, that's actually a really good analogy. I want to start using it myself. Um, when, you know, when you're sitting down, you know, I'm just imagining like when I sat down with, you know, who's now my wife and we had that first coffee at Starbucks back in the day, it's like, did we talk about our exes or did we kind of avoid that topic for the first day? Like, I don't even remember, but the, the idea here is like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily start that date with like, Hey, I'm trying to impress you. So let me tell you all my baggage and let me say all these mean things about my ex. You wouldn't do that on a date. You want to be respectful and you want to talk about the good things. But the interesting thing that he brings up in this podcast is, um, you don't want to just say, you don't want to just talk about the good things. You also just want to pivot that conversation completely and say, I'd really rather talk about you and me and like what we're doing here, um, in this interview. And so, you know, yeah, I worked at that previous job. It was a short amount of time, but I'm really actually really focused on this job and this role and this is what I bring. And you can like totally sort of change the topic of, of the conversation by uh, sort of switching gears a little bit to, to talk about why you're a good fit for that job. But some people are going to press the, the question and say, well, you were only at that job a little while or, you know, why did you leave that job? You were only there for a couple of months. Well, do you be honest and say I got laid off or I got terminated? Like it's, it's embarrassing to say that you get terminated from a job. Um, but you know, I, I think it's important to be honest, but I think that you can do that in a way that you can still bring integrity to your answer and, and talk about the good things that you learned about the job without just dwelling on and highlighting the negative side of things and not really hanging on to um, uh, like why you got terminated. But just like the question, you know, what are your three biggest weaknesses? Um, you do need to show self-awareness, what you learned from it and how you're not gonna do that thing on that job. It would be the same kind of answer for why did you get terminated from that job? You can say, you know what, I really messed up this particular system or I thought I was accomplishing this kind of goal, but it turns out they were, they had something else in mind and we just weren't aligned on what those goals were. And, you know, I'm taking the blame for it because I wasn't communicating effectively or I didn't check in often enough. Uh, like you can kind of put yourself under that bus a little bit, but then talk about what you learned from it and say, I realize now that was not the way to do it. And so I've been a whole lot better just even in my personal life of having that accountability to make sure that that's not going to happen again because I don't want it to happen here at this job because I'm really interested in this particular aspect of the role. And if I get the job here, I want to make sure that, that that's not a repeat uh, pattern that I have. And just really showing that self-awareness, the humility of why it happened and being able to talk about like how you're not going to do it there. Now, the third scenario that I want to talk about is when there's a layoff, like just, you know, they don't get that round of funding or something like that and you just lose your job. Um, that can happen. That can absolutely happen. Um, the good news is it's not your fault. And so it makes it a whole lot easier to talk about. You can say everything was going great. I really like the team. I really like the, the thing that we were working on, the product, the engineering side of it, like all that was super interesting. It's just this scenario happened and I got let go. Um, you know, especially with like 2020 happening, people got let go from jobs. Um, and then it was really hard to find a job for a while. And people are now like getting back into hiring and things like that. And so you might have that gap on your resume where you got let go. And now you've got to explain not only how you, how or why you got let go, but why there's a gap on your resume. In, in the case of 2020, you'd be like COVID, COVID happened, you know, and now I'm like back on the job trail. But if it's a thing where it's like, you know, I started this job and it just didn't work out um, and something happened and I got let go because the company decided to go in a different direction. So our whole team got cut or, 
you know, let's say the senior devs got let go and therefore they let all the junior devs go. So I got cut, like whatever that may be, or just business was not doing well and they had to reduce the workforce by 30%. And I was just, I was new enough on the job that I was one of the first ones out the door. Um, that actually happened in a lot of the dot com busts that happened like back in 2001, 2008. Um, you know, the first people or the last people that got hired are usually the first ones back out the door because you're, you haven't necessarily proven yourself. You don't really have a lot of that loyalty built up and they would rather keep the people that have been around a while that have that sort of internal domain knowledge. Um, and so it's disappointing when it happens, but when you get laid off from a job, it's not your fault. And so they can't hold it against you. Like it's not your fault. You got laid off. It just, it's a, it's an experience that happened, but being able to talk about it is gonna feel awkward. Like, why did you get dumped by, by your ex? Um, it's like, well, you know, this or that happened, you know? Uh, now, uh, I mean, I can't directly relate it to a relationship with the layoff, because getting dumped is more like getting, uh, getting fired from the job. But you can say, you know what, just something, something just didn't work out well. I learned a lot while I was there, but I'm just, I'm back on the job hunt. Um, and your company seemed super interesting. I wish I'd found you like several months ago and I wouldn't have even had to take that job. I could have been here. Um, you know, you can just really talk them up about why their job is really meaningful to you and, and just switch, switch the conversation, like change, not like you're not changing the subject necessarily, but you're drawing attention to the positives of like, I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm looking at my future. I can tell you about my past, but I'd really rather tell you about my future and where I want to be headed. Um, and I think that uh, this guy's experience or this guy's uh, uh, explanation on his podcast actually made a lot of sense. So go check it out. It was only like a couple of minutes long, uh, the podcast. So go check it out. He had some good things to say, and, and he generally has some pretty good stuff on his podcast. It's not all relevant to the tech industry, um, but he does have some pretty good stuff to say there. So definitely check that out. Um, and he also runs a whole website about like sign up for mock interviews and things like that. But again, there, I think they're going to be more like mock behavioral interviews. Um, cause as I recall, his business wasn't specific about, uh, the tech industry. He was like a previous like executive recruiter or something like that. So he's going to be just more like general business kind of interviews, but, uh, but worth checking out either way. Like I said, he doesn't sponsor my channel in any way, shape or form. I just happen to follow his, uh, his podcast on Spotify. Um, cool. The last one we'll get into, how do you avoid talking about a previous job that you don't really want to address in an interview? Um, and this one's from Samantha. Um, and I appreciate this topic too, because sometimes there are aspects of our job that we don't want to really make public. Um, some things about our job are just going to be really hard to deal with. Um, you know, especially for people that are changing their career and getting into tech. Uh, they might say like, oh, you used to do that. Like, tell me about that job or tell me about that last thing that you did and you're like oh i really i don't want to get into that um again you can kind of touch base on it a, a little bit and tell them like some of the good things but you don't want to get into these long drawn out explanations about all the reasons that you wanted to leave that industry you can just say you know what i i was in that industry i did that job for a period of time i decided that this is what i'd rather be doing and so I went through this tech training or I went to university or college and I'm, you know, I'm out and now I'm doing this and your company's super interesting. And again, just put the perspective on them, put the, put the attention back on them and where you're going in the future. So you don't have to dwell as much on the past. So I wanted to kind of ask those questions from Alex and Samantha, kind of back to back to point out, like, you don't have to give them the full history. You don't have to really dwell on the past. Just you can touch on it. Tell them the good things, but then completely avoid it and just, you know, change the topic a little bit and just talk about the future and talk about why their company is important and, and what you hope to uh, sort of uh, provide for them at that job, like what you're bringing to that job and say, you know what, these were some of the skills at that previous experience that I had. These are some of the skills that I'm bringing. Um, and you don't even have to avoid it. Like I, I would, I would even hesitate to use language like, oh, I really don't want to talk about that aspect of that job. I wouldn't even bring that up. I would just say, if there's things you don't want to talk about, just don't bring it up. Just don't bring it up. You don't even have to say, I don't want to bring this up. Um, now, if they, if they continue to press, you can say, um, you know, you can use language like, um, you know, there were some aspects of that, of that job that made me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but I don't want to get into too much of that detail 
you know, as part of the interview process here. I'm happy to like have that as a, as a conversation later. Um, but for now, I really want to focus on like this aspect or that aspect of the interview and, and just kind of continue to look forward, um, you know, to the tech career that I want to start. Um, and so you can kind of like pivot that and, and hopefully they take the hint. If they keep asking, then you have to be a little more assertive and just say, I really don't want to talk about that aspect of that job. Uh, that's in my past and I'm looking forward to this other thing and I really don't want to dwell on that. If there's a particular reason why you need to know that information, we can have that conversation. Um, but otherwise, you just kind of have to advocate for yourself and it will feel uncomfortable, unfortunately. Um, but I think it's an important thing to be able to kind of stand up for yourself and just say, I don't want to talk about that in the interview. Um, I think you do need to be a little bit uh, sort of diplomatic about it. Like, you don't, just, you know, you don't want to like, start cussing them out and be like, stop asking me that flipping question. Like, you know, I'm not going to answer it. Hopefully they take the hint. And if they don't, you can just say like, Hey, can we, can we focus on some questions that are relevant to the role? Or do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions about the role and like totally shift gears and start asking them the questions and see if you can kind of pivot that whole conversation into something else. Um, and if they bring it back, just change the topic again. And if they don't take the hint after that, then you can start saying like, Hey, you know, I, I noticed you're asking me this or that kind of question like a lot. I'd really rather not talk about that aspect of that job. I'd really rather talk about this or that instead. Um, and if that still doesn't get the point across at that point, you can just say, you know what, these questions are making me uncomfortable. I really don't want to answer them and just leave it at that. Because at that point you've told them several times, you don't want to talk about it. And if they keep dwelling on it, then it's your choice to like walk away. Um, but if that, if it keeps happening with a particular interviewer, please give that company feedback and say, Hey, you know what? I realized that this aspect of, you know, my previous job might've been interesting to hear about or talk about, but there were aspects of that job that I didn't want to discuss. And this person kept pressing on it. Even after telling them several times, I didn't want to explore sort of that avenue of, of discussion. Um, and it just made me very uncomfortable. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention, um, not to like, call them out specifically in a negative way, but I just wanted to give some feedback on my experience as a candidate in the interview. Uh, I think a lot of companies will appreciate that you take that time and, and give them that feedback. Cool, well, we're a little over our hour here. Um, anything else going on in chat? There's a handful of people uh, hanging out in chat. Hopefully things are, are going good. Anything else going on with Job Hunt and stuff like that? Any other topics you wanna talk about? I'm happy to kind of switch gears, keep answering these kinds of questions. Um, so yeah, I'll give it a, give it a minute here. Um, let's see what else can I talk about in the meantime? Um, oh yeah. So for those that weren't, uh, on the stream early, uh, we got a guest on Sunday that's going to come talk about, uh, her job hunt and how she ended up juggling a lot of job offers. Uh, so that's going to be pretty exciting to kind of hear about like how she organized, uh, that whole job search. Um, and then next Thursday, um, I'm planning to have Sean Prashad, I think that's how I pronounce his last name, um, on the stream. He's got to curate a bunch of lead code problems uh, that he's kind of sourcing from other places. And he, he built like a whole front end app out of it um, that I've been recommending for almost a year now to people. And uh, he's been gradually improving it over time and doing some really cool stuff with it. So I want to talk to Sean about like, you know, how he got interested in that kind of project and, and so on. Um, all right, one more question from Ty. A random recruiter reached out to me the other day and scheduled a 15 minute phone call with his boss and me. No idea what to expect or why they reached out. Any thoughts? I would ask them why they reached out. Um, you know, if they scheduled a call, um, I would say like they shouldn't have scheduled a call unless they ask ahead of time, can we schedule a call? Uh, at which point you can say like, what do you want to talk about? But if it's a recruiter, um, I would say it depends a little bit on whether you're willing to entertain, uh, you know, job interviewing. If you want to go down that route, if you're happy at your job, you can just say, thank you. I appreciate it, but I'm actually not looking for new work at this time. Um, but I've also said on the stream too, it can be helpful just to keep interviewing at other jobs. Even if you're not looking for another job, it can teach you a lot about yourself. Like, am I staying up to date on my skills? Am I, staying up to date on how I explain different things. Am I, you know, uh, or maybe just to go learn how other companies do interviews. And then you can come back to your company and go, Hey, I heard about this other company that does an interview in this way or that way. What do you, you know, what sort of signals do you think they're getting from that? Is that something that we should incorporate? Like 
uh, you know, you can start to make those changes in, in your own company. Um, oh, Ty said they did ask. I asked what they wanted to talk about and they didn't answer. <laughs> um, I mean, if you know that they're a recruiter and, and they want to bring their boss into the conversation, it's probably going to be, you know, about like, hey, you want to come work for us. Um, and you are definitely looking for a job. Okay, finish turning next week. Oh, cool. Do I know any companies hiring juniors? Um, not offhand, honestly. I've, I've kind of stayed out of the, uh, the job hunt game, but there are a number of Slack communities that I can recommend. Um, I mean, the, the Turing Alumni Network is, is obviously number one. They've got a good job hunt in their, in their uh, Slack chat. Um, there's some other ones. There's Denver Devs is the Slack community that you can look at. Um, there's another one called Boot Campers Collective uh, that I hang out in uh, quite a bit. Um, and they'll commonly find sort of entry level jobs specific, you know, that, that sound like they're going to be good specifically for boot camp grads or, or code program grads. Um, there's another group that I've been kind of chatting with more lately. Um, it's called Virtual Coffee Club or something like that, or Virtual Coffee. Um, so you can look them up. And then those are probably the top ones that I would that I would look into as far as like other Slack communities, because they've all got job channels. Um, and ways of sort of networking with one another. Um, so, I mean, the number one way that you're gonna get that job, honestly, is gonna be networking. As an entry-level dev, networking is gonna be your number one way of getting a job. You can, you can blind apply, um, there's nothing wrong with that at all, but honestly, you're gonna do a lot better by doing network and outreach and, uh, and talking to people at a company and getting a job that way. That's, that's far more likely going to be uh, the better route to follow there. Mostly kidding, Turing Channel's super active, yeah, it is. Um, so yeah, congrats on, uh, finishing Turing. It's a, it's a big accomplishment for sure. Um, but as far as that other job where they didn't really tell you what they wanted to talk about, it's probably about a job. Uh, if, if you know that they're a recruiter, they're, they're trying to recruit you for a job. The question there is, are they a recruiter for the company themselves? Or are they like an agency recruiter and they want to talk to you about pitching your resume to other people? Um, so if it's, if it's a recruiter from a company themselves, I would absolutely entertain that call. Me personally, um, if I found out that somebody was like a third party agency and they just wanted to shop my resume out to other companies, I would tell them to take a hike, um, but probably not in such pleasant language because um, I don't like agency recruiters. Um, but early in your career, that can be helpful. It's just, it's a lot harder for an agency recruiter to place an entry level dev, so they're less likely to talk to you. So it's very likely a recruiter from a company. Um, and if they're a recruiter at the company and they have already seen enough of your background and they know enough about you to know that you're an entry level dev and they still wanna have that conversation, I would absolutely make time for that phone call. Um, Cause again, it might just be like a networking opportunity if nothing else, um, but you're an entry level dev, you're gonna be looking for that job in a week. So yeah, start making those phone calls for sure. Cool. All right. Well, I think I'm going to start to wind down a little bit and uh, kind of chill for the evening. So I'll get this video up on YouTube in a little bit. Um, I've still been in the process of like releasing all those other Q&A videos. I think I'm most of the way through October now uh, scheduled up uh, a whole bunch of those Q&A videos. Um, and I'll probably get back into doing like a Q&A session like every like three streams maybe. Um, because I think that they're really helpful, um, but I've, I've noticed the questions are tapering off a little bit, but that's fine too. Um, but uh, I also don't wanna like flood my channel with just Q and A things all the time. But I'm happy to uh, sort of entertain different kinds of questions over time. Uh, tonight's format was actually really helpful uh, just to kind of collect a couple of things of like, these are like burning questions today, right now from people um, and kind of addressing those on the stream right away. So hopefully that was helpful. If you do have other questions, you can always drop me a line at techinterview.guide. All my contact info is on there. You can uh, find me on LinkedIn and Twitter using the same uh, username that I use here on Twitch, just Ian Douglas 736 uh, definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. We can connect over there. You can DM me questions. I'm more likely to answer uh, DMs on LinkedIn than other uh, channels. But you can also DM me on Twitter. My, my DMs are always open on Twitter. If you've got questions, anything I can help with. Um, but if you connect with me through LinkedIn, I'm happy to make recommendations and introductions and all that kind of stuff too. Uh, so yeah, by all means, just reach out and let me know how I can help out. Um, and then if you have just questions that you're okay with uh, asking on the stream, I mean, definitely let me know. If you want a resume review, I do those. 
Uh, I'm going to start doing those again on Sundays um, primarily. And uh, I might do one with our guest uh, this coming Sunday. Might get her take on uh, on a tech resume. We'll see. Um, but uh, you can go to techinterview.guide slash streaming and you can see all the information there about how to upload a resume. I do ask that you anonymize it so we're not like showing your you know real email address or phone number on the, on the stream because these do go up on YouTube later and we don't want people harassing you. So please uh, anonymize it. Um, and then uh, happy to give you my thoughts and perspectives on that. Same with cover letters. If you ever want me to uh, uh, you know, look at a cover letter, I'm happy to do that. Um, aside from that, I think we'll wrap up. So thanks for hanging out on the stream and we'll catch you on Sunday. Um, yeah, so Sunday we got uh, someone coming in to talk about their job hunt and next Thursday we got Sean to talk about uh, Leak Code. Cool. Thanks, uh, Taya, for your questions as well. Uh, it was nice having you uh, hang out on chat. Good luck uh, finishing up the turning next week. That's exciting. So, good job. All right. Have a good night, everyone, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers. <laughs>